Price of Bitcoin near an all-time high. Get big blow to the crypto bros. The Bitcoin is working. It's making nations shiver in their boots. No one's willing to stop it. Well, no one's willing to say, okay, enough. Okay, so there's a lot happening with crypto right now, and I need to tell you about it. The government is cracking down big time on crypto. Multiple investigations, billion dollar lawsuits. They're arresting CEOs in other countries. And now 18 states are suing the government because of it. The lawsuit is charging that the agency's crackdown on crypto companies is unconstitutional. So why is there this crazy war happening between the government and crypto? It's a long story. A story that's so much bigger than just some shady crypto companies or government bureaucracy. It's about a fundamental shift in how we value things. It's about the breaking down of trust in institutions that have held our world together for centuries. And unless you're deep in it, there's a lot of words that most of us have never even heard of. I wanna break this all down for you by going all the way back to the beginning to answer one question. Is this the end of crypto? There's been far too much fraud. This is really the wild west and it's around the globe. Okay, let's start with the basics. On one side of this war, you have the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Their job is to protect investors from scams and maintain a fair, orderly, and efficient market. It's very important to know when the SEC got its start. Back in 1929, the stock market crashed and wiped out millions of American savings. Millions of people lost their jobs and the global economy entered into a Great Depression. To rebuild people's trust in the market, FDR created the SEC to regulate Wall Street. The first person he put in charge of this new agency was his friend Joseph P. Kennedy, a millionaire investor and the father of John F. Kennedy. The main question the SEC tries to answer from day one is, is this thing that's being sold a security or a commodity? To understand the difference, let's imagine you run a lemonade stand. At this lemonade stand, you sell lemonade, this thing that customers can touch and drink. It's a physical asset, a commodity that they're paying you for. And the value of this commodity is based on supply and demand. The more people that want to buy your lemonade, the more you can charge for it. But let's say your lemonade stand is booming and your friend wants a piece of any future profit, a share in the future of your business. So you're making money off of selling lemonade, the commodity, but your friend is making money off of the promise that your business will continue to boom. This promise is a security. Stocks are the most common examples of securities. A stock investor is investing in the promise that that business's profit will go up. Why does this difference matter? Because commodities like oil, gold, or lemons operate in basically free markets. Their value goes up and down mostly based on supply and demand. And because of that, they're very predictable. Let's say a country that's a big producer of wheat, like Ukraine, goes to war. You could predict that the value of wheat will probably go up because the war will make it harder to get that wheat. If there's less supply but the same demand, the commodity's value will increase. But securities are not that easy to predict. There's no real way to predict whether that stock you're investing in will go up or down. That company you invested in could either boom in the future or completely shut down. And what happens if the CEO of the company is giving you a fake promise that the company will grow when it's secretly running out of money? What happens to your investment when this scam company collapses? That's why the SEC is there to make sure you as the investor are not getting caught up in any potential scam. They mandate companies that offer securities to tell the public exactly what their company is about, the truth of how they're actually performing and the risks associated with investing in it. This security versus commodity separation that the SEC regulated worked for decades until 2008. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. The major banks on Wall Street offered crazy cheap and risky mortgage loans that caused the entire housing bubble to burst. Jack to the tax! The banks gambled with people's money and crashed the whole system, leaving millions of people without homes and jobs. And then right after, taxpayers had to bail out those same banks that caused the crisis. People were obviously furious. They lost any trust they had in the traditional banking system. They demanded a financial revolution. Something needs to change. We need an economy for the people and by the people, not by the rich and for the rich. Something completely different. Something not controlled by the big banks or the government that just bailed them out. And a year later, it happened. Something called Bitcoin. Brother, can you spare a Bitcoin? Bitcoin. The world's first cryptocurrency was here. Now, I'm not going to get into too much technical detail about how cryptocurrency works. 
It has to do with this like public ledger on the blockchain and you can like send transactions on a peer to peer network that's encrypted. It's a whole thing. It honestly doesn't matter. The most important thing to know is that Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency. It exists outside of the traditional banking and government system. The structure of cryptocurrency itself means it can't be regulated by banks or governments. Instead, every transaction is publicly verified. Like this transaction in 2010, this Florida man traded 10,000 Bitcoin to buy two Papa John pizzas. Because back in 2010, 10,000 Bitcoin was worth $41. Making this the first known commercial transaction using just Bitcoin. Bitcoin was this revolutionary new thing that people were starting to actually buy things with without banks or governments knowing anything about it. But in 2010, it was still kind of underground. Not too many people actually heard about Bitcoin, and those that did, didn't really take it too seriously. Tell you the truth, I, I honestly don't get it. Why not use regular dollars? Well, no well, we don't even idea. know who invented this. No, I mean, you're no literally idea. putting real money onto a system that we don't even know who created it. They're trying to reinvent the wheel, and they've come up with a flat tire. You'll see in a minute how quickly that's all gonna change. Because if that Florida man kept his 10,000 Bitcoin, Today, he would have almost $1 billion. So Bitcoin at this time was still under the radar, but something happened in early 2011 that would get the government to start paying attention. Impossible to trace website which sells drugs, weapons, forged documents, and even hitmen. It's called the Silk Road. This 26 year old was who created the Silk Road. And the official currency of this marketplace was, you guessed it, Bitcoin. This new digital currency that's untraceable by the government. This was the real start of the government's crackdown on crypto. Ever since Silk Road went live, cryptocurrency has been associated with criminal activity. This dream of a decentralized, unregulated currency now had a huge target on its back. A couple months after Silk Road launched, US Senator Chuck Schumer asked federal agencies to shut it down. And two years later, they did. The FBI shut down Silk Road, found and arrested Ross Albright, and seized 144,000 Bitcoin from the site. Albright was later given two life sentences without possibility of parole. And then the FBI auctioned off the Bitcoin they seized. But even with this crackdown, interest in crypto only grew. More and more people were getting their hands on Bitcoin and another new crypto called Ethereum. This is also when things start to get very confusing because there's also this other agency called the CFTC, which is kind of like the SEC, but it deals with commodities instead of securities. And the CFTC rules in 2016 that Bitcoin and other virtual currencies can be classified as commodities. But the SEC was starting to believe that they're not commodities, but securities instead. And so need to be regulated like other securities. So you have these two government agencies that sometimes agree and sometimes don't. But before we get into whether crypto actually is a commodity or a security, something else happens around this time that's really important to the story. Donald Trump wins the presidency of the United States. He is now going to be called president-elect Donald Trump. Donald Trump is elected and takes office on January 2017 as the 45th president of the United States. But Trump in the beginning is not really a huge fan of crypto. And I don't think we should have all of uh, the Bitcoins of the world out there. I think they should regulate them very, very high. Bitcoin, I, it just seems like a scam. I don't like it because it's another currency competing against the dollar. Around the same time, a young Sam Bankman Fried starts a trading company, which will later be part of a cryptocurrency exchange, a place where small time investors can put their money in and trade in crypto. Cryptocurrency was moving away from being this currency that people use to buy pizza. It becomes this kind of digital stock that people weren't even buying things with, but instead just investing in to make a profit. By the way, at the same time, the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum skyrockets. That one Bitcoin that was worth zero in 2010 is now worth $19,000. A huge growth in just seven years. The crypto boom was happening. A bull run where it seemed like nothing could stop the growth of crypto. But as crypto grew, the SEC was becoming more and more convinced that all these new cryptocurrencies were in fact securities. On December 22nd, 2020, the SEC announced a lawsuit against Ripple, a company which created one of the largest cryptocurrencies at the time, XRP. The lawsuit alleges that XRP is in fact a security and that Ripple didn't provide investors with the proper information they needed to invest. Basically, the people were throwing their money into this thing that's kind of a mystery, a violation of those laws established back in the 30s. 
But this was just the beginning, because just 24 hours later, the SEC chairman resigns, leaving his position open for the next administration. CNN projects Joseph R. Biden Jr. is elected the 46th president of the United States. The new chairman, President Biden, appoints to the SEC is probably going to become the most hated person in the crypto world. He sets his eyes directly on regulating as many cryptos as securities as possible. As securities which are not safe to invest in and scams that leave millions of people defrauded. There's been far too much fraud. This is really the Wild West and it's around the globe. In April 2022, Gensler announces that the SEC would begin to register and regulate crypto exchanges as securities. But then shortly after, he clarifies that he does believe Bitcoin, and only Bitcoin, can be classified as a commodity, but the other currencies as securities. It all gets very messy, to the point where the SEC commissioner starts criticizing the SEC chairman's decisions. This constant back and forth between all these different agencies was only confusing the now 18 million Americans who had crypto. But then on November 11th, FTX files for bankruptcy. A month later, its founder Samuel Bankman Fried is arrested on seven charges of fraud and money laundering. It's revealed that he stole approximately $8 billion from FTX users, which he then used for private jet flights, luxury real estate in the Bahamas, and for political donations to pro-crypto candidates. This becomes one of the largest cases of fraud in American history, and it turns off a lot of people from crypto. A lot of people start to see the dangers of this unregulated crypto industry, and the SEC uses that distrust as fuel to go even harder on crypto. By the start of 2023, the SEC charges two of the biggest crypto firms, Genesis and Gemini, with selling unregistered securities. Each charge coming with a multi-million dollar penalty. And then in June, it also charges Coinbase and Binance, the largest crypto exchanges in the world, as operating as unregistered security exchanges. I told you it's a lot. If you want to read more, I put all my sources in a description, so feel free to check it out. Okay, so where were we? We've made it now to 2024. The SEC is going after cryptos left and right, labeling them as securities that need to be regulated the same as stocks. That's why 18 states just filed a lawsuit against the SEC. They allege that these actions by the SEC are an overstep of its authority. That the decision to label crypto as a security or not should be left at the state level. But hold on, is crypto a security or not? Some say it's definitely not. My view is that most forms of cryptocurrency should be in the category of commodities, not securities. They fail the test of what securities were all about in the first place. While others argue that it should be treated like a security. If I buy Bitcoin, Am I buying a share of stock or am I buying a pork belly or am are I buying? you buying air? You're buying something that other people believe either is going to go up in value. Presumably that's why you're buying it or think it's going to go down in value, which is presumably why someone else is selling it. But that's it. If we go back to our lemonade stand example, where does crypto fit into all this? Is Bitcoin like the lemonade that's on sale? Or is it the currency of your friend's bet on the business? Or is crypto something else, something completely different that doesn't fit neatly into either category? I personally don't have an answer. I can see arguments from both sides, but whether you believe crypto is a security or a commodity, one thing is clear. We might be getting our answer soon from the White House. CNN projects that Donald Trump has been elected president, defeating Vice President Kamala Harris. A couple weeks ago, Donald Trump won the election to become president again. After calling Bitcoin a scam years ago, Trump now has done a complete 180. In his 2024 campaign, he ran as the pro-crypto president. The United States will be the crypto capital of the planet and the Bitcoin superpower of the world. We don't know yet what policies Trump will pass once he takes office in January, but he's surrounding himself with people who are very much pro-crypto. And the prices of cryptocurrencies have exploded after his win. First because Gary Gensler just announced his resignation, but also because there's a general confidence that Trump will deliver on his promise as the pro-crypto president. We'll just have to wait and see what happens next. So there we have it. That's where we're at as of the recording of this video. With this ongoing boom that's happening, it seems like crypto is not ending anytime soon, especially since more and more people are interested in it. But this is actually part of a much larger trend, a trend of people increasingly losing trust in the institutions that have kept our modern world together. 
More and more people are becoming disillusioned with the government, the banking system, the media. Our modern world has been held together for centuries by these strong centralized systems. But as a divide between rich and poor grows, and as more crises happen, many of which are caused by those same systems, people have begun to search for alternatives. Alternative forms of government, alternative media, and a radically different financial system. That's why I don't think crypto is going anywhere. Because even if one day crypto is completely dismantled, there's probably going to be something new that replaces it. Another new technology that offers an alternative to these centuries-long systems of control. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. In full disclosure, I'm not a big crypto guy myself. I have friends and family who are, and they're really keeping up with everything. Um, so if you're like them and you think I missed a big piece of this story, definitely let me know in the comments. This video took weeks of research on my end because I wanted to gather reliable data to present to people like me who saw some of these headlines about what's happening but they don't really know the full story. If you like this episode of Digital Footprint, make sure to like and subscribe. Digital Footprint is a show where I investigate the impact of new technologies on our lives. The more people that subscribe to the show, the more it lets YouTube know that people are interested in these kinds of deep dive investigations. All right, thanks again for watching. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Jack to the test!